Well, welcome back to another video Bible lesson as we continue through the life of Christ. Today we're dealing with an interesting passage. It is from the Gospel of John, and it's the first 11 verses of chapter 8, which uh, I'll deal with in a second, and then uh, we'll go into it. We need a little bit of explanation before we do that, but let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. So, Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word and to study it. Again, as always, Lord, help us by your spirit to be honest to the scriptures and also to see from it what you taught and what you wanted taught to those uh, to whom it is read by. So, Lord, just guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, we're looking at this very interesting passage in John chapter 8. If you're using any other version of the Bible other than the King James or the New King James, you will notice a footnote stating that there is question as to whether this was an original part of the Gospel of John. Uh, King James doesn't have that because the King James relied upon what's called the Texas Receptus, which is um, older older in the sense of in the 1500s, 1400s, 1500s uh, manuscripts. However, the more modern versions, which is NIV, ESV, um, those NASB, those sort of translations that have manuscripts that find an earlier source, question whether this passage should be in the Gospel of John in the sense that they weren't included in the older or more original manuscripts. So let me just explain that. The common thought is it's like a photocopy, and then you take that photocopy and you make another photocopy of that, and then you take that copy and make a photocopy of that, and then you take that copy and you make a photocopy of that, and on and on. And if the words become a little distorted or blurred, you want to go back as close to the original as possible. And as you go back to the a more closer text to the original, in other words, maybe only the photocopy of the original, you'll be able to read what should be there. So with that understanding, there's always a study in um, archaeology, in biblical theology, to look for the texts that are closest to the original. Now, when we talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, we believe that the Word of God is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. In its original autographs, that's always included, those little extra words, which means we believe that what Paul penned with his own hand was without error. We believe what John wrote with his hand, the original autographs, were given to him by the Holy Spirit directly, and they were the very words of God. What we carry to church on Sunday and what we open are what we call faithful representations of the original, where the text in 2 Timothy 3.16, for all Scripture it's given by the inspiration of God. That applies to what, first of all, to the Old Testament, and it applies to what the Scripture was of the New Testament that was written by Paul and John and the other writers. It does not necessarily have a promise that what we carry to church with us um, is without copyist errors. Now, I know that sounds uh, a little alarming, but we believe that, and all evangelical churches believe, that we hold faithful representations of the original. Faithful representations. But whenever there is a translation that is being produced, like the NIV, NASB, uh, ESV, and even the original, um, what we call Texas Receptus, which was the basis of the King James, there was always a desire to find, in archaeology to find, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, to find copies 
as old as possible, as close to the original as possible, believing that as, as you go back closer to what actually Paul wrote, then indeed that would be the most accurate copies of the inerrant scripture, the original autographs. However, there are no copies of what Paul actually wrote. There are no copies of what John actually wrote. Uh, and the first copies really are what's called uh, Alexandria or Sinaitis, uh, which are, you know, four or five hundred years after the conclusion of what was written. So, having said all that, when the more modern translations looked at the uh, scriptures and looked at the copies of the manuscripts, they find this passage in John not there. It doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it's not uh, in the scriptures, but they're saying they're not confident that it was here written as the original part in this section of John. Now, to some people that sounds alarming because it sounds like we're saying that the Bible is not God's word. We're not saying that. We're saying in the study of how the word of God is put together in the last 2,000 years, as they look to the older manuscripts, there's question as to whether this passage was at this point placed in the Gospel of John. Well, the question is then why are we even preaching it? Well, because I believe it's a true story and everyone believes it's a true story. It, the question is to whether it was slotted in this place as opposed to maybe originally placed in another gospel or somewhere else in the Gospel of John. So I don't want to get too crazy on this, but here is, if I can hold it up, here is your Greek New Testament. The Greek New Testament um, is just the New Testament in Greek, but you will notice the bottom part of every single page are other possibilities based on the manuscripts of what exists in the top part. And that is true on every single page. And so what they do is they look at all the, this is the Gospel of John I have open here. They look, in, they look at the passage and say, does it, does it uh, collate with all the other Gospels? In other words, is this passage of Scripture, um, how confident are we that it was in the original? And they grade them A, B, C, D. John chapter 8 is graded as a D, which means it is the least confident uh, that it was actually at this place in the Gospel. Again, it's not to say it wasn't in the Gospel, but to say they're not confident that it was actually at this place in the Gospel, because as they look at the older manuscripts, as closer to the original, they find either there was an asterisk there. For example, Jerome uh, writes that it had a asterisk in his translation of the Bible, and he even said he's not confident that this passage occurred exactly at this place. All right, I'm not going to talk about that on Sunday, um, but I am going to explain that to you because you do need to understand, and whenever we do uh, a Bible teaching, I'm hopefully going to teach how the Word of God is put together, how to interpret the Word of God. Uh, we're going to do that maybe uh, over the summer. It's not, it's just, we're just talking about that right now. But anyhow, um, if I do, am I able to teach how the Word of God is put together? We'll deal with this in a more detailed way. We have confidence, an absolute confidence, that the Bible that we read out of is a faithful representation of the original, okay? So I don't want to mislead people. Liberal theology, and I, when I say liberal theology, I'm talking about those who reject the Word of God. They don't even start at that point. They will say that what Paul wrote was his own personal opinion and not Scripture. What Paul actually wrote with his hand was just fable or fantasy, so they begin that it isn't even God's word originally. So there's two types of what we call criticism. There's higher criticism, and higher criticism is those who will try to argue that 
the Bible is not God's word. They deny that Jesus is actually God. They will reject the virgin birth. They will say the story of Noah is a fable. They will say the first 11 chapters of Genesis is all fable, all the creation story. That's higher criticism. And that is what the big debate was exactly 100 years ago in the 1920s that led to the split of the Baptist churches, led to the split of, this is in Ontario, led to the split of the Methodist churches, led to the split of the Presbyterian churches, uh, led to the split of the congregational churches. So the groups of people who denied the virgin birth, denied the inspiration of scripture, denied the creation story, uh, believed in multiple Isaiahs, and all of that, that just really denied scripture, they all gathered together and they formed a new denomination and they united themselves as a denomination that rejected the word of God. And that became the United Church of Canada. Um, the Baptist denominations uh, that split uh, fought what was called the, the Baptist controversy and that was in McMaster University in Hamilton. And you can look up that. And um, those denominations or those groups of churches that split away from McMaster University as being liberal uh, went independent. And in 1953, many of them gathered back together again after about 30 years of being independent. And they said, let's have fellowship together. And that was the beginning of the Fellowship Baptist. Okay, a little bit of history. Um, some churches are still independent. Jarvis Street Baptist Church in Toronto, Toronto Baptist Seminary still exists, uh, is a fantastic Bible school, uh, solid reformed, solid Bible teaching, and it was instrumental under a man named T.T. T. Shields uh, that was uh, instrumental in splitting away from McMaster University in Hamilton. Um, the group of churches that remained at Master at uh, McMaster University became the Convention of Ontario, Quebec, which is now known as Convention Baptist. Anyways, there's a little bit of history, but just to understand that those churches who have remained faithful to the Word of God, um, and Thousand Island always was, and now Grace, and those other churches that have gathered together, some are still independent, some have gathered as a fellowship of evangelical churches, which is now what we call the Fellowship Baptist, um, and other churches that are still independent, um, hold that the Word of God is the inerrant, inspired Word of God in its original autographs, and that's where we are. Oh, that's a lot. But anyways, that's a very, very, very quick overview. All to say this, the reason we're preaching this Sunday and teaching on John chapter 8 is because we believe that it is Scripture. We're just not confident that it's meant to be at this location in the Gospel of John. But we're not denying that it is a true story, that it actually occurred, that it is a valid teaching of Christ. It's just that when we put the Scriptures together, we're just not 100% sure it should be where it is. But in the chronological order of events, it does fit. So we're going to preach and teach this valid passage of Scripture in John 8. So if you have your ESV or NIV or uh, NASB or what other, other, any other version, uh, you will see a little asterisk or a note saying something along the lines of not being sure that it's in the original manuscripts where it's located. Okay. And I'm sure I raised a lot more questions and answers, but it's a huge topic and... Uh, we're going to teach it on Sunday because, again, I'm confident that it is Scripture. Okay, so having said all that and giving you a little bit of Baptist history, <laughs> and you can you can look it all up line, look up the McMaster controversy if you want to Google something, the Baptist controversy, or look up Jarvis Street Baptist Church, Toronto Baptist Seminary, which is still a great Bible school in Toronto, and. Um, holds to the same doctrines that we hold to. Okay, now having said all that, let's pull up this passage in John chapter 8, 
and look at the situation. It says when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is this hill directly across from the other hill that Jerusalem sits on. So Jerusalem is on Zion, this mountain. Um, and then there is another hill right directly across called the Mount of Olives, known as that for its olive trees. It is there that the Lord will give his beautiful um, teaching on the destruction of Jerusalem and some aspects of the second coming of Christ in what we call the, uh, the Olivet Discourse or the Conversation on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse. It's recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And um, when I do teach how to interpret the Word of God, we'll spend a lot of time in that because the Lord then tells things like, you shall see, you know, wars and rumors of wars and all that kind of stuff. And some of it is vastly misinterpreted and some of it is uh, correctly interpreted and we need to work all that through. And again, that is Lord willing coming, but we'll see. Anyhow, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning, he came again to the temple. So what he would have had to do is he would have gone down the Mount of Olives. He would have gone through what's called the Kidron Valley. And then he would have walked up the other hill to the actual city of Jerusalem. And in the city, of course, the centerpiece was the temple, Herod's temple that Herod had built, uh, rebuilt from Zerubbabel's temple, rebuilt from Solomon's temple. Okay. And so it is now at Herod's temple that Herod the Great had reconstructed that Jesus is there with his people. And he says, all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. So you could just picture the Lord uh, in the temple courtyard. He is recognized at least as a rabbi in the least of cases. And so being such and recognized as such, and certainly because of his wisdom and his, uh, the fact that he, you know, his reputation had preceded him, there would have been a large group of people who were gathering around him as he taught. We don't know what he was teaching, but he had a large crowd. The scribes and the Pharisees were extremely jealous of him and wanted him to, um, you know, they wanted to kill him. Um, but they had to find a legitimate excuse to kill him. Now, Roman law had said by this point that the Jews were not allowed to carry out executions on religious purposes without Roman authority. That's why when they did crucify Christ, they had to take him um, before uh, all, all the Roman authorities and have those trials before uh, the Roman authorities. But now they're trying to build a case, at least, to have someone executed. So what they're doing now is they're setting Jesus up, and they're trying to find a reason to bring him um, to the Romans with, uh, with an excuse saying, we want him put to death because he broke our religious laws. We can't do it, but you can do it, and we want you to try him and have him put to death. So that's what they're aiming for. So as he's in the courtyard teaching, it says the scribes and the Pharisee brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. And they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Now let's back up and look at this whole scenario. Jesus is in the courtyard, he's teaching, he has a crowd around him as he's teaching, and in walk the religious leaders with all their robes and, you know, with all the pomp and ceremony that would surround them and, you know, wanting people to split and move out of the way because they love the praise of men, um, and they were dragging this woman behind them. And they dragged her to Jesus. Now, why would they bring her to Jesus? Well, the reason is what we read in the next. Let me just pull that 
scripture back up. It says, and this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And so John recognizes that this was the purpose. They didn't bring her to get his approval. They brought her so that they could trick her. The emphasis was not on the woman. The emphasis was on Jesus. They were using her to get to him. It's like putting a worm on a hook to catch a bigger fish. And that's what they were doing. She was the bait to catch Jesus. Now, the interesting thing is this. Yes, the Levitical law stated that a woman who was caught in adultery could be put to death. However, from what we understand, it was rarely ever done because Levitical law also stated that she had to be caught in the act of adultery by two witnesses. So it wasn't good enough to say, well, I saw the lady coming out of the guy's house. It wasn't good enough to say, you know, we, we, uh, we intimidated or, or we somehow intimidated a man to go in and tell us what happened. Rather, there had to be two witnesses, literally, that would have had to burst into the bedroom and catch her in the act. Now, what happened to the guy? Well, obviously, they didn't care about the man that was involved in adultery because, again, she was only there as the bait to catch Jesus. She was there to ask Jesus the question, what do we do with her? Hoping he would say, well, I don't know, let her go. And then they would have the accusation, well, he breaks the law, and therefore he's more guilty than she is. Or they were hoping he would say, put her to death. And then they would go to the Romans and say, he wants to have this lady killed without a Roman trial. And again, he would be found guilty. It was much like um, when they said to Jesus, you know, you haven't paid your taxes. And Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, he, they're trying to trick him in one of those, no matter what you do sort of situations, we're going to get you. Now, the interesting thing is, it says when they brought to woman, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. The word caught is a tense called perfect. It's a perfect tense, which means it's continual action in the present tense. Uh, so something that is perfect or pluperfect in, in grammar is continual action in the present tense, which means it wasn't a one time she was caught. She was a prostitute. That's what they're saying. Um, it wasn't just a lonely wife. It was not just a one-time affair. This was a woman who they knew was a prostitute and who had a history of committing adultery. So the implications of what the gospel writer is saying is this. They staged it. They had one of their men go in and find a prostitute and set her up. And then they had two other guys burst into the room and catch their, you know, their friend um, in the action with this prostitute. It was a staged event. Okay, so this is what the whole scenario is pointing to, that they had set this up. And they, were, didn't, they didn't care less about the woman, whether she was put to death or not. That was totally irrelevant. It was Jesus they were after. She was the bait, and they didn't care what happened to her. And so they literally had a, uh, a sting operation set up to bring a prostitute, probably with one of their friends in the action, that they could now say, let's put her to death. Now, because of the fact that it did take two witnesses who actually saw it occur, in reality, as I said earlier, in reality, putting a 
woman to death by stoning was very rarely ever done because it was hard to prove. But sure enough, they had it all put together. They had the scenario all set. They had it, had her tricked into this situation. They knew she was a prostitute. They knew she was going to be available. They had a guy go in. Then they burst in and found her. They let their friend go, and then they drag her to Jesus. So that is the implication from the text that we have about the scenario. They bring this woman to Jesus, and they say, teacher, really, rabbi, the lowest regard they could give Jesus, but they had to acknowledge him to some degree. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Well, the question is, why are you asking me? Like, why are you asking me? If you're so confident that you caught her, and if you're so confident that the law of Moses says that, and you're a scribe and you're a Pharisee, why are you dragging her all the way up the hill into Jerusalem and dragging her through the courtyard and bringing her into the temple? Why are you doing this? So it was very obvious that this was a staged event solely for the purpose of tricking Jesus. All right. And now it says, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, we don't know what he wrote. And I've actually heard, <laughs> I've actually heard a guy preach a sermon on what Jesus probably wrote. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't say. So I don't know why he would write that. All we know is the word wrote Um the typical Greek word for write is graphi, where we get a graphic. We get the English word graphic from, or, uh, you know, graphic is, is the transliteration of the Greek word for write. Um, the word wrote here is catagraphic, so, uh, which means write down. He wrote something down. That's literally what it means. What he wrote in the ground, he wrote something down. He, he actually... Um, detailed something in the dirt when he bent down. We don't know what he wrote, and we could guess all sorts of things, and we're not going to do that. But the Lord specifically wrote down something with his finger in the dirt, in the ground of the courtyard of the uh, temple. The fact that he bent down to do that, obviously he needed to do that to write in the dirt, it also showed a very humble um, uh, response to the situation. He didn't stand up and look at her and say, oh, you terrible woman, you should not have done that. No, nor did he condemn her or, you know, he didn't do that. He bent down and he wrote in the dirt. And again, that whole action, that whole um, demeanor of what he was doing shows a very humble and a very meek response to a situation that he knew was a trap. The Lord knew that those Pharisees were there to trap him. They knew that they were, or he knew rather, that they were there to uh, use this poor woman to get to him and that she had no value at all in their eyes. And when he bent down and wrote in the dirt and wrote down something specific in the dirt, which we don't know what it was, and I'm not going to guess, it did indeed show that the Lord Jesus was a very meek, mild, wise individual. And it says, and they continued to ask him. In other words, he's writing in the dirt and they're going, hello, hello, Jesus, answer us. And then he stood up, so he stands up eyeball to eyeball, and he says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, they brought, they brought this woman to Jesus for him to condemn her. 
he is now condemning them. He has turned the whole situation around, and he's, he's not even dealing with the woman. That's what they wanted him to do. He's not dealing with the woman because he knows the evil that is within their heart, that they were there to try to uh, rebel against the message of the kingdom of God and to rebel against Christ himself and to rebel against who he was as the Savior. And so he just doesn't deal with her. That's what they wanted. He turns the situation around and deals with the Pharisees. And he says to them a very piercing question. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, according to rabbinical law, when somebody is being stoned to death, the witnesses who caught that person are the first to throw the stones. They get the first stone to throw, as if it's a privilege, I guess. I don't know. But they're the first ones to throw the stones. But what Jesus says, he who's without sin. So he opens up and saying, you know, you say you're witnesses, but let me tell you, anybody here who's as innocent in God's eyes who thinks that they have a valid witness against this woman, in God's eyes, who is more innocent? Who is the witness? Who is the one who has, uh, who has lived the life, who calls themselves worthy to throw a stone against this woman? And it says, and he bent down and he wrote in the ground. After making that incredible statement, he just bends down and he starts writing again in the dirt. Again, not something they would expect a rabbi to do. And again, a very humble, meek response to this antagonistic situation where they were there to, to uh, trick Christ into a response. And he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, that'd be the scribes and the Pharisees, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And that's the key there, eh? Why is that key? Well, because it's like a police officer, I always say. You get a, a, a police officer who comes right out of the academy. He wants to give you a speeding ticket for going 81 kilometers when the speed's 80. You know, he's like black and white, black and white. Every, you know, you broke the law. We got to give you a ticket. Even young pastors or new pastors act like that. But anybody who has more life experience and more ministry experience and more, you know, understanding who they are and their own failures realize, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because I fail all the time too. Pride, arrogance, wants to condemn. Humility and an understanding of how guilty you are before a holy God as well and how justified you are to be condemned makes you realize, mm, yeah, I think I'm going to leave now. And so the older ones, the, one, the, the men who knew that they had lives that were unworthy themselves and who were honest with their own sin and knew how unworthy they were before God and they themselves had some degree of humility uh, and awareness of their guilt and, and the goodness of God to still love them in, in the midst of their guilt. They were the ones that left first. You know, the younger ones were like, yeah, we want to kill her. We want to, you know, we want to put to death. But eventually they all smartened up too. And as the Lord sat on the ground and wrote with his finger, he finally looked up. In fact, it says, uh, Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, looking at the woman now, where are they? 
has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. In other words, there's no one here to condemn me anymore. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So let's look at the comment that the Lord made. When he said sin no more, he knew that her life was a life full of sin. So he's not passing her over and saying, ah, don't worry about it. He recognized that she was living a life of sin. He knew that. He also knew that there was no one to condemn her because they were all just as guilty as she was. He also knew that, she was in, that he was imparting to her, that the Lord Jesus was imparting to her that wonderful Romans 8, for now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Go and sin no more. It was a beautiful picture here of how all of mankind is equally guilty in the eyes of a holy God and that we have no right to condemn one another when we are just as guilty as everyone else. We are just as guilty. And when there is any sort of action of pointing out a sin in someone's life, it needs to be done with weeping and tears, knowing that we too are guilty before God. It is not something to be done lightly, but it also is that wonderful truth that if they come in repentance, there is no condemnation. In their salvation, they come to Christ. In their repentance as a believer, they're restored just don't go and do that anymore. Stop your sin and realize the grace of God. The Lord was showing this dear woman that, yes, your life is full of sin. I recognize that. Stop it and live for me. Live for Christ. Find the forgiveness that Christ bestows. And so she was a recipient of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the freedom from the guilt of her sins to which he was going to achieve on the cross. But it also tells us of the contempt that Christ had for those who mocked him and who tried to set themselves up as those who are great religious leaders when in reality they were guilty sinners and had no right to come before Christ and condemn him when in reality they were more guilty than he was. It reminds me of Psalm 2, and on Sunday I am going to look at Psalm 2. I'm going to pull that up right now because I think Psalm 2 goes well with this. Why do nations conspire and peoples plot in vain? Kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord, against his anointed one, saying, let us break their chains. Let us throw off their shackles. In other words, even today, our world shakes its fist at Jesus and the godly teachings of the word of God. They want to be free from God's judgment. They want to be freed to live a life of sin. They want to be free from the, the mercy of Christ and live in immorality. And they shake their fist at the skies, at Jesus, at his word, and at Christians. And then in verse 4, the one enthroned in the heavens laugh, and the Lord scoffs at them. You know, in other words, the hatred of the world towards Jesus, Christ just laughs it off because he knows he is victorious. And there, just like the scribes and the Pharisees who dragged this poor woman before Christ, they try to condemn Jesus. They try to condemn the kingdom of God. 
but he will be victorious. Our hope, our joy, our enthusiasm as we look at this passage on Sunday is to realize that Christ is the victor in a world full of sin. He is those he is the one who will bring salvation to those who are full of sin to restore the wayward believer and to proclaim victory over this fallen world. There is so much in this passage that encourages us that this poor lady found the grace of God and found the forgiveness while the religious leaders who hate the word of God, who hate Christ, walked away even more angry than when they came, but none of it touched the throne of God. He laughs at heaven, from heaven, at their foolishness, because he knows he is the glorious one. Christ is the victor in our private lives and in the world as a whole. Christ is the victory. All right, Lord bless you all. Read this passage over, and uh, it's just good to understand the, the goodness of God in a troubled world. All right, Lord bless you all.